Hello, it's Heather from the Sunshine and Power Cats podcast. In association with Geeks Rising from the 10th to the 16th of August or 11th to the 17th if you're here in New Zealand, we are hosting the second 2019 Sunshine Summit. It's a week of live streams with amazing content creators and their communities with the theme of celebrating connections. All of the details for the upcoming summit, as well as replays from our previous events and where the live streams will be happening, can be found at sunshinesummit.live. A huge thank you to the patrons of Sunshine and Power Cuts for making it possible. So check it out, and if you know our guests, we'd love for you to come and celebrate with us. And if they're new to you, come along and learn more about them, and we look forward to celebrating connections with you. I'm Anthony Bachman from All Things Good and Nerdy, a geeky podcast, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other fantastic geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And welcome to Play Comics, the show where we look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material. As always, I'm Chris, and today I've got Derek Graziano from Rolling Misadventures. Derek, how are you today? I am wonderful. How are you doing, Chris? I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm so excited to look at this, The Rocketeer, and I can't believe I'm seriously saying that because this is a movie I saw like once or twice as a kid, and it never really left my brain, but I never thought of going back to it at all. Yeah, I had never seen it, even as a kid. I just remember all of the reviews when it first came out in 91, I think it was, uh, saying how horrible of a movie it was. So we never rented it. I mean, in 91, I was five or six right in there. Yeah, same here. So I don't know. Maybe I just I picked a lot of movies based on their covers when we ran by Blockbuster. Oh, totally. It's got that great uh, image of him kind of standing up in front of the flag, uh, depending on kind of which covers or movie covers you're going with. So the basic premise of the Rocketeer, movie-wise anyway, because that's what we're going to focus on more since that's what the games are in theory based on, is that a, a young hotshot pilot just randomly finds a jetpack in his hangar. And then there's Nazis and hijinks. You know, I was really surprised how long it took them to get to the Nazis in this movie. I was surprised there were straight up Nazis in this movie. It just kind of came out of nowhere. Like for the longest time that was sitting in my head and I'm thinking, okay, this is a Disney movie. I'm probably just misremembering Nazis, getting it mixed up with something else. And then we saw like the big old henchman guy with the really bad plastic mask. And I'm like, okay, this is probably like the one Nazi guy, but they won't really say it. And then there's, I mean, there's straight up swastikas in a Disney movie. I know there's a good, like 10, 15 minutes of dialogue where it's just in German, no subtitles. That's how much they committed to it. That was the part that really surprised me because I was expecting there to be, like maybe they would translate it for somebody else on the screen. And then I was wondering if it was just because I rented it from Amazon and they just didn't put it in there, but I've seen other things where they have subtitles. So I don't know. Yeah. So the Rocketeer, like we said, it's a 1991 Disney movie back when Disney was sometimes doing live action movies that were actually live action. Yes. That is a shot at jungle book. And I mean, there weren't too many people in it that I recognize from other things. Oh, see, so yeah, I went the other way. And maybe it's just because I'm older now that I actually recognize them. Because as a kid, I would have had no idea who half the people were. It had uh, Jennifer Connelly in it, who 
pretty much looks exactly the same as she was in the labyrinth. That was half the people I recognized right there. <laughs> uh, and then also Timothy Dalton playing kind of the main villain. And that was the other half. Yep. Everybody else, I had to look them up. Oh, same. But I didn't recognize it from anybody. Um, Kaylee let me know that Alan Arkin was in Little Miss Sunshine. Ah, okay. I guess I'd seen Edward Scissorhands at the wrong time, so I didn't recognize him from that. Um, I didn't recognize him as being in Little Miss Sunshine until Kaylee pointed that out. No, Paul Sorvino, honestly, I just thought was a guy that looked like somebody else. <laughs> didn't realize he was somebody I should actually know. What else was he in? Oh, Goodfellas is probably the big one. Oh, okay, yeah. But he was also a Nixon. And a lot of smaller roles and a bunch of stuff. Well, that was the really interesting thing with this movie is that a lot of the cast were previous to uh, this movie in smaller roles. I mean, obviously, Timothy Dalton and Jennifer Connelly being the exception. The lead here, Cliff, played by Billy Campbell, hasn't really been in too much. That I've yeah, noticed I, anyway. I didn't recognize him at all. A lot of TV things, and I mean, I only know that because I looked it up. And a lot of movies that I just haven't heard of. Mm -hmm. And of course, SVU, because I think me and you are the only people in the world who haven't been on that yet. And probably I might be the only person who doesn't watch it. Hmm. I don't watch it anymore. I think that was mostly of my parents watched it and I was just in the room with them kind of thing. Ah, I gotcha. But this whole movie just has, it's such a product of its early nineties kids movie time. And that's the weird thing about it. I mean, yes, it is nineties Disney, but I don't even know if I'd consider it really a kid's movie. Now that you say that, it's really weird that that's how I've thought about it, because the only time I've heard people saying they watched it was when they were a kid. And it's got the Nazi stuff in it. It's got the almost sexual assault in it. It's got uh, the big henchmen folding people in half. Yeah. Maybe it's not a kid's movie. I mean, you also have to remember when back in the 90s, when we like early 90s, when we were kids, we probably watched a lot of stuff that shouldn't have been on our radar, like RoboCop and things like that. Yeah, it's, it's just it's weird to think about it, because if it's not a kid's movie, who is this movie for? Uh, apparently, anybody who was against the Nazis. Hey, works for me. Because The Rocketeer was a fairly new-ish comic. Comics started getting printed, or at least the character started appearing in April of 1982. So, I mean, you're not going to have adults who really grew up with this character wanting or finally having a chance to go see a movie with him. Except for a, just a really small sample of the population. And it's so weird that it was 82 because I don't know why I thought that it was way older than that. I mean, it's just kind of a testament to that style of pulp era comics that I thought, especially with all the Nazi involvement, it would have been significantly older than that. They did purposely set it in like 1938, Los Angeles, New York, and it's a giant parody and homage to a bunch of the pulp fiction from that era. They did a really good job of getting that time frame in there and just getting the feel of that era. Oh, totally. So Cliff Secord, like we said, he's a stunt pilot. Um, he races planes, does all kinds of things in the movie here. He's trying to get ready for the nationals and they never really explain what that is. I'm assuming it's a racing series. Yeah, just a big national plane race, as you do. Hey, why not? 
and somewhere out on the road, there are federal agents chasing somebody who stole this briefcase. And we don't know what's in the briefcase, but they drive right through the hangar that everybody's working in. They drive right on the runway. Cliff's plane gets shot by a machine gun. And so he has to make an emergency landing on the runway, runs into one of the cars, and the guy carrying this briefcase sneaks into the hangar, switches the contents of the briefcase with a vacuum that they have in the hangar. And the plan is for him or somebody to go back and get it later. But Cliff and his mechanic PV find it first. Yeah, it was that weird uh, just happening of events that all led to this perfect moment of finding the jetpack or the rocket pack in the seat of one of their other planes that they only sat in because that first plane got shot down. I mean, I'll just throw this under the column of here's one of the things I have to believe in this movie and just accept it and move on. Yeah, that's fair. There's plenty of other things that I had to force myself to believe. Yeah. So from there, PV fixes up the jetpack. There's a bunch of hijinks with getting it to work. And of course, you have gangsters working with Nazis. Uh, Spoilers for a, oh, I don't even want to think, 20 plus year old movie because that's as old as I'm going to let myself say so I don't (laughs) feel ancient. The gangsters don't know they're working with Nazis. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that later, but... Just keep that apart in mind. Yeah. So they're all running around trying to get the jetpack, and Timothy Dalton's character, coincidentally enough, is an actor. And they're filming a movie in a local place where Jennifer Connelly's character is being an extra, and Cliff has realized that he's kind of been a bit of a butthead. And not treated her well. So he sneaks in to the set, tries to apologize to her, and tells her about the jetpack. Timothy Dalton's character hears it and decides that he doesn't really want to fire Jennifer Connolly anymore because he's looking for the jetpack and he knows that he can use her to try to find it. And one of the weirdest parts about this scene, too, is the fact that Timothy Dalton stabs a guy. And very little seems to happen with that. I mean, this was 1938 Hollywood. Oh, true. I don't think it was too long after the um, Noah's Ark flood scene. Hmm. I don't know. But according to Pop-Up Filmcast, I never watch movies anyway, so I don't know. So from there, I mean... (laughs) I don't want to recap the entire movie for you, but it's <laughs> it's basically the gangsters go around, try to get the jetpack back, and Cliff figures out how to use the jetpack, so he uses it. Yeah, I wouldn't recap this whole movie, mainly because uh, I was watching, looking at the runtime. It's about an hour and 50 minutes. And probably an hour of that could have been cut out from just random gangsters looking for the jetpack. Yeah. I mean, watching it as a kid, it was fun. Watching it with my wife, it was kind of a fun watch. But there's not really a whole lot that goes on for most of the movie. One scene I really did love, though, was... When the gangsters kidnap Jennifer Connelly, they take her over with Timothy Dalton to make a trade for the jetpack. And that's the point where they learn that Timothy Dalton is a Nazi. Yeah, keeping in mind, this is about an hour and a half into the movie at this point. I don't know how they didn't know this. Except he might have been a really good actor. So maybe that's the only excuse. Well, the best part of that reveal is that he just speaks in a bad German version of English for the rest of the movie afterwards. Yeah, I didn't catch that because I don't speak German hardly at all. No, it was like he was working for the fur. Like that level of bad. 
Oh man, I'm so mad at myself for not catching <laughs> that now. I mean, in fairness, he didn't have a whole lot of lines after that. It was a lot of action scenes for the last uh, 20 minutes or so. I really want you to go see the movie. Everybody who hasn't. So I'm not going to tell you what happens to get to the end. But of course the good guys win because it's a Disney movie. That it would have been an even shorter comic run if he didn't. Yeah. Because the comic has run for a while off and on like they were still printing some of it at least a mini series debuted in december 2015 yeah i was looking into it it looks like uh they were all collected back up around 2009 and re-released and then there's been weird mini runs since then so it, it's really cool that people have kept working on it and but i don't know anybody who even knows this as a comic unless they just happen to catch that one little note in the opening credits. Well, there's that in the very fourth wall breaking spiking of the camera as they say, Oh, you mean like in the comics? Yeah, I guess that should probably give it away. But the whole, I mean, it's a fun movie. I think, you know, I've seen worse movies. It, it wasn't a great movie, but it wasn't terrible either. It, it just was a waste of, you know, an hour 40, hour 50. If you're going into this expecting it to be a dumb 90s movie, then you're probably going to enjoy it. Yeah, I can see that. If you're like my wife's friend who probably got dragged to watch it the same night that I watched it back at her place, you're probably going to hate it. And I'll definitely get my wife to ask her what she thought of it because we went to dinner with some people and I just asked Kaylee if she wanted to watch it with me. And the other guy there just lit his face lit up. It was amazing. And he, we were pretty sure that he was going to make his wife watch it with him when they got home. (laughs) But Derek, any other thoughts before we drop some promos for a few other shows and talk about the game? Uh, You know what? I think we pretty much covered it. It's, so bad it's not so bad that it's good it's just so bad that it's passable so uh, yeah if you're gonna watch it maybe you know have a couple drinks just kind of kick back know what you're getting into but i mean it's it's all right yeah you won't want to tear your eyes out but if you never see this you're perfectly fine and if anything else you can just lament with the terrible jokes that will come from watching that movie with your friends in worst case jennifer connelly oh yeah i'll say it on that note let's drop some promos for a few other shows and then come back and talk about the game hi this is emily prokop from the story behind which is a podcast about the extraordinary history behind the ordinary what does that mean It means whenever my ADHD gets the best of me, I begin to wonder the stories behind everyday objects. This is the story behind sporks, behind chewing gum, behind hoodies, places. This is the story behind Mount Rushmore. This is the story behind speakeasies or people. This is the story behind Uncle Sam. This is the story behind Betty White. Everything has a backstory. And from what I've noticed from doing the show, not everything is as plain and simple as history books may have you believe. Join me Mondays and Thursdays on your favorite podcast app or at the storybehindpodcast.com. And thanks for listening. Hello, I am Adam Higgins from the Odd Dad Out podcast, where normal is not my specialty. What does that mean? Well, I just can't do one thing. Every week, I give you a sampling of personal stories, rants, ramblings, or just spending a day to nerd out a bit. Plus, I make fun of some weird news stories, and I tell you about a podcast that I think you should check out because sharing is caring, right? So if any of that sounds up your alley, subscribe to Odd Dad Out at odddadoutpodcast.com. Those are some great shows you should check out, but first let's finish up with this one. There was a regular Nintendo game for this, which I think is really weird. 
I mean, not too much. It was 91, so some people were still playing the original NES. They were, but I just think the game itself was really weird. Oh, yeah, totally. So obviously this thing came out to go with the movie. There's no other reason why you would release a movie and a game in the same year based on a super obscure comic. Plus, you know, you want that uh, movie game tie in with Disney, you know, you're going to make bank on it. Yeah. Like Capcom had done such a good job with DuckTales doing that. Everything else. I don't care if that came out later because it's my go-to example right now. And this game kind of follows the movie mostly ish. Sure. Maybe <laughs> in a really loose sense. I mean, it immediately throws you into a hangar with the jetpack costume shooting at what I think are gangsters. Yeah, they don't do a very good job of telling you who they are in the game. Keep in mind, this is still the era uh, where they expected kids to read the instruction manual. Oh, yeah, that's true. Had I had the instruction manual, it might have been easier to play. In the game itself, it doesn't really tell you what's going on. So they're expecting you to either read because the instruction manual does give you a bit of a background or have seen the movie or I guess just not care. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of what to add to that because that, I mean, pretty much summed up this game is just not really caring. I know I kind of feel sometimes like if the game is good, then I say it sticks with the comic better. But I mean, there isn't really anything, I guess, too special that I'm seeing about the Rocketeer. So I'm not really seeing anything too special about the NES game. No, it's your basic sprite based uh, side scrolling shooter with a rocket pack that you can move slightly faster through the level. I have seen some people speed running this one. Uh, I think it was somewhere in the 10 to 15 minute range they were getting through. Yeah, I I think I watched one of those earlier. I think it was around 13 minutes. I'm not sure if it was an actual play or a program run, but yeah, I had played it up through the first, uh, up through the first stage because if you actually stop and play it as intended, it takes probably a good 15 minutes to get through that level, assuming you don't die constantly. And then when I got into the second level and actually was using the jetpack, it just got way harder and I had no desire to finish it. This game, it handles weird. It doesn't really look good. The sound is weird. And there's just nothing about it that really screams Rocketeer to me, besides the fact that you have the jetpack and the helmet. Pretty much, yeah. And grenades for some reason. I'm not even sure if grenades were invented then. I mean, I'm sure they were now that I say that out loud. Oh yeah, I'm totally falling down that rabbit hole later. Yep. Um, bonus episode, when were grenades invented? <laughs> Probably the biggest difference visually between this game and the movie is that all the swastikas are replaced with lightning bolts. Oh, you know, I didn't even think to look at that when I was watching the speed run. Yeah, I mean, there aren't too many of them anyway. It's just on the Zeppelin at the end uh, that you have to fight on. But, I mean, they're just... It's weird to me that Nintendo would draw a line there where the Disney movie didn't. Well, again, with... The old Nintendo games, you assume that they were going either into an arcade or into kids' hands. All of the video games were very much marketed as toys. So, yeah, I could see why they would censor that. I mean, they censored way more stuff in other games. Yeah, I think it's mostly just still me being surprised that Disney let that through. Especially with as much as uh, we know about Walt Disney later on. Yeah, you'd think he would have wanted to hide a bunch of that stuff. I mean, he was dead by this point. Yeah, true. I don't know. NES game. If you could find it super cheap, I guess, play it so you can speed run it. Sure. Why not? Because I couldn't think of any other reason to go back and play it. Uh, Because you want to torture your friend. Oh, there you go. 
there. That's probably the perfect reason. But there's also a Super Nintendo version of this. Which is significantly better. Which isn't really saying a whole lot. But it it's not as bad. See, I was going to say the Super Nintendo version is even dumber. Oh, it is, but it follows the movie a bit more at least. Okay, I'll give you that. Because the Super Nintendo version is basically, let's do a few mini games. And then do them over and over and over. And let's start with one of the hardest mini games. You are racing around a track where there are three poles set up that you can see. And you have to fly your plane around all these poles to make sure that you're essentially staying on the track. Because it is an airplane race. You can't exactly have a lane for them to stay in. And for some reason, this level is just ridiculous. Oh, yeah. I spent a good, oh, probably 20, 30 minutes trying to just beat that first level before I found a level skip cheat. Like, if you're watching somebody play this game, it doesn't look that hard. It looks like, oh, yeah, I'm just flying a plane, essentially in a circle. Just like your normal first level let's figure out how everything works kind of thing but that's not what it is at all no it's got this weird and i don't know why they did it this way but there is a screen at the bottom that shows a behind the plane view and you're supposed to be flying as close to the poles as you can in a 3d space while watching basically the track itself on the top screen take up uh, three quarters of your screen And it's just ridiculous. Yeah, on top of trying to navigate a 3D space on a 2D game. Also, the fact that there aren't really lanes. You got the other planes slamming into you, causing you to crash. And for whatever reason, they're just like, oh, better luck next time after you just crashed a plane into the ground and exploded. Well, I mean, you have your three chances. I'm sorry, I just always think it's funny when they call them chances in a game. That really doesn't have anything to do with this at all. Yeah, it's a weird distinction. So then you win the race, eventually, maybe, and you get to do it again. And it's even harder. But essentially the same thing. Um, I mean, these flying levels, it's worse than landing the plane in Top Gun. I still, to this day, have never done that. Neither have I. I might have to go back and do that. There's another rabbit hole for me after I look up the history of grenades. Well, everybody look forward later to Derek's rabbit hole podcast. Actually, that makes you sound like a flat earther. Don't do that. So when you finally get through the flying levels, you get over, you go into the hangar, and there's a whole gang of gangsters out there to shoot you. Because why not? That's exactly what this game needed. After a really crappy flying level that's way too hard, it needed a shooting gallery where you just hobble back and forth and shoot at gangsters that I don't know how many there are, but it does take a while to get through. So at least a couple hundred. So I was watching a playthrough of this this morning and I'd start a level, get maybe 15 seconds into it, and then just skip ahead in the video to the end of that level. That's probably the right way to do it. There's no reason to watch the whole thing if you're you know, just wanting to see what happens because it's just five or ten minutes, whatever, of watch somebody fly in a circle or watch them shoot at all the gangsters that pop up in kind of an on-rail shooter style thing. It almost looks like it should have been a light gun game, but using the D-pad, it just makes it so much harder. Oh, see, a light gun version of this would have been amazing. And I really hope they were planning on that. I mean, at least passable. Like with all the different mini games, I'm wondering if Disney was trying to spark the same magic that they had with the old Tron arcade game, where they could just throw you in all these different things because they have a million different control knobs. See, that would have been cool. Or because what I was thinking was they were planning this as just a regular arcade game anyway. I mean, it has to be. 
especially when you look at the levels after the Unreal shooters. Well, I know one of the ones after that, you have to do the racing again, but this time with the jetpack. Which, that one I actually did beat. Go figure, when you can fly twice the speed of the airplanes, it makes it easier. Um, imagine that. But then you also had side-scrolling shooter levels. And this was so disappointing because I love a good side-scrolling shooter. But this one was just ridiculous. You're just... I mean, on, you're... On, on top of flying up with the jetpack and... I'm assuming chasing the Nazis at this point, because I'm pretty sure the gangsters weren't flying around. Uh, just trying to take out tons of enemies in a level that takes way too long. Uh, being Having missiles shot up at you from the ground, uh, grenades on parachutes. It, it, it was just bizarre and kind of asinine. See, this is the part that really made me think it was meant to be an arcade game, because that just screams quarter muncher to me. Oh, totally. And you get through that, there's another shooting gallery level, which isn't really any different from when you did it the first time. Up until the boss. Yeah, the boss it does get fun. I mean, you're basically hanging out in the hangar with your jetpack that lets you fly to the ceiling and back to the ground to pick up power-ups. And then you're going to shoot at this weird Nazi helicopter that fires bolts way faster than you. Keeping in mind, you still have a handgun this whole time. Yeah, because you don't get any other weapons. That's it. So if you can manage to take out an entire Nazi helicopter all by yourself, you get to go to another side-scrolling shooter level. Woohoo! But this time you get to be in a plane. Yeah, I don't know why you would switch to the plane. The rocket pack would have been so much cooler. I know. Maybe they were just trying to get some variety in there. You would have had to make an entire new sprite for that. So it's not even like the developers were lazy. This was an intentional choice. Yeah, I don't get it, especially because at some point in the level, there's a cutscene, and, oh yeah, I'm going to take the jetpack from here. So maybe he was just trying to save fuel to catch up with the Zeppelin or something? I don't know. I guess. I mean, that kind of makes sense, especially when you go back to the movie with the jetpack getting shot up and just kind of leaking fuel throughout the movie. I don't know. I mean, neither one of these games... I think both mm, I think both of these games were kind of started well before the movie was finished. I mean, they would have had to be to come out the same year that the movie came out. But I don't think they knew what was going to be going on in the movie. Can you imagine? That must be the worst feeling. You put out this game, you're like, yeah, this is all right. And then you go to see the movie and it's just, oh, oh, no. Oh, see, that must be horrible. Like. I'm really hoping that they looked at the comics and thought that the movie would be a lot closer to the comics because the bad part is I can see in these games where, oh yeah, maybe Nazis got plans. So there are actually Nazis with jetpacks because in the movie, there's only this one jetpack and it gets destroyed. And in theory, the plans disappear, but they actually stick around with the mechanic PV. Well, it looked like they were his own. Like, that was his own jetpack that he was... Or was it something that he just traced over and made a copy of? That That's the one part I couldn't figure out. I'm pretty sure Jennifer Connelly stole at least a page of plans. Yeah, with his name at the bottom. I don't know. It's not important. Because <laughs> it, nowhere in the movie are there Nazis with jetpacks. I know. If there were, I don't think they would have worried about this one particular jetpack. I would have just chalked up the loss at that point. Because they showed you how ridiculously hard this thing was to fly. You'd have to have people who really knew what they're doing. And were able to shoot guns while they were doing it. And could defy the laws of physics and have their fire point kind of down but move straight ahead. And also not burn their legs while they're doing it. And have gum able to keep the fuel <laughs> inside your jetpack. Eh, comic book movies. Yeah, we're poking holes all over the place. Just like the jetpack. There we go. Brought it all together. 
So there is a PC version of this as well. I didn't look at it. I actually played this one before I played the Super Nintendo version. And the only reason is because, or the only reason I swapped over to it, the Super Nintendo version, was because of the level skip. Because it's basically the same game. Frame rate wise, it runs it slightly smoother. But the best part is with the comic panels and dialogue that pops up between the levels, it's all voice acted. Oh, I wish Super Nintendo had gotten that. I know why they didn't, but I wish they would have. Like, it's still that crappy early 90s digitized voice, but I don't know. It just seemed like there was a bit more polish in uh, I think that there was just a, it made it feel like there was a bit more polish on the game. Yeah, and I do want to say about these comic panels, they look really good. And then you realize that they're reusing comic panels. Yeah, I was scrolling through one of the comics earlier just to make sure of that. And yeah, it actually looks really good for a pixelized version of it. Like, I've got to give them credit for that. That's easily the best thing they put in the Super Nintendo and PC versions of the game. It's just weird that they would use those comic panels for a movie tie-in game, but still change so much from that. Like, coming through the comic uh, earlier today, seeing Cliff's girlfriend named Betty, who looks oddly like Betty Page later on, uh, be changed to Jennifer Connelly named Jenny. Like, why make that change if you're still going to use stuff from the comic? I don't know. Movie tie-ins are weird. Like, it just made me think that Jennifer Connelly couldn't remember that she was supposed to be playing a character. So they had to use her name. But this is after Labyrinth, right? Yeah. Significantly. So she, yeah, I should have obviously known that. Um, let's just leave it there. <laughs> it's not like this is her first rodeo. I don't know. It's just like the movie was weird. The games were weird. I'm assuming the comics are weird from what I saw. So especially looking at the movie side of things as opposed to the comics, because this is a movie tie in game. What do you think these games really get right? Uh, there's a jetpack. That might be it. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. They give people the right name, at least as far as the movie is concerned. Yeah, true. And the setting really does, I mean, as much as you can in these era of games, the setting really does seem to fit nineteen, late 1930s New York and Los Angeles. Oh, totally. And with the movie itself, because it's shot in the early 90s, the film quality isn't the greatest, but that just kind of lends itself to the setting being in the 30s. And what do you think these games really get wrong? Uh, in the case of the Nintendo game, pretty much everything i mean it's it's really hard to say when in the movie there's not really a whole lot to it there's gangsters there's nazis there's a jetpack and timothy dalton looking like inigo montoya so the games don't really have a whole lot to get right or wrong so in the nes game there's a jetpack there's nazis and there's gangsters cool yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, you end the fight or you end the game on a Zeppelin. Which, of course, explodes and you get the girl. So in that sense, maybe it's really close. It is, which is kind of shocking when they did everything else so terribly. Oh, we're getting into Phantom 2040 territory here. And the Super Nintendo game, I mean, it, it kind of captures the flying and action aspects of the movie a lot better. Yeah, but it it got weird with the story. Like, the whole point of the movie is that he couldn't fly in the Nationals because the plane broke. And you start by flying in the Nationals. I mean, it really makes me feel like they, they're trying to make this game be a sequel but then you have to keep Timothy Dalton's character in there. But he fell out of a Zeppelin, so he's probably dead. But he's a comic villain, so he can never really be dead. It's a lot to wrap your brain around. 
It really is. So if you had somebody who wanted to get into the Rocketeer, would you hand them the, either of these games as a bit of a primer course? I might have them watch it, but not play it. Because if I wasn't doing an episode on your show to talk about it, playing that first level in the Super Nintendo game would have made me never want to go back to the comic. I can understand that. Because watching somebody for a speed run or something, they make it look so easy. And you're not spending 20 minutes on one level. Yeah, because I was seeing them finish that race in a minute or two. And the NES version of it, yeah, just no. Yeah, just run through all the enemies, pick up hearts for the few that you kill, and apparently that's the way to play that game. Speedrun is really cool. But other than that, I don't think there's any reason to really put anybody through that. No, not at all. I mean, a lot like most of the other movie tie-in games, I'm just going to have them watch the movie. Even then, I mean, we couldn't really recommend watching the movie other than, hey, if it's there, watch it. Otherwise, don't go out of your way. Yeah, but I'm definitely going to pick the movie over either of the games. Very true. So, Derek, if people like hearing from you, where else can they find you around the Internet? Uh, You can find me on the show Rolling Misadventures, which is a tabletop podcast meets improvised collaborative audio drama where we play the game fiasco with my co-hosts Megan from Odo Lit Class and Charles from Talk and Roll and guests from your favorite shows like an episode we did with Chris. We take that story that we created by playing a tabletop game and then put an audio drama spin on it with backing music, sound effects, the whole nine. So it's a bit more polished and gets you in and out with two episode story arcs. So you never have to worry about a long back catalog. I know that two episode story arc is really how I'm pitching it to people because I tell them it's an actual play and like, oh, okay, I don't want to go back and listen to everything. It's like, no, just pick an episode. You'll be fine. Plus, we get to hop around with the two episode story arcs. So we've done things like uh, uh, comic book superheroes that were terrible people. We did a, a recent art gallery slash uh, heist style episode, which is out right now. And all the way to like a weird spaghetti Western soap opera. It's kind of all over the place. So I'm sure you'll find something that you're into. It's a really great show. So if you haven't checked it out yet, you should definitely get on that. And as always, if you like hearing from me, you can head on over to Twitter at Play Comics Cast. Get into the Facebook group at playcomics.com slash Facebook group because I have it forwarding over there. And you can also support the show by either visiting the merch store or going to check out Ninja Penguin Pods on Patreon, but links to those will both be down in the show notes as well. Also, don't forget that despite the fact that we haven't put one out in way too long, Kaylee and I still technically have a podcast called Bedling Kids where we look at Scooby-Doo, and I will eventually try to convince her that Scrappy is not the spawn of Satan. Also, don't forget that Play Comics is a proud member of the Gunna Geek Network, home to such wonderful shows as Better Podcasting, where Stargate Pioneer and Stephen John Drew share their podcasting tips, tricks, and, you know, just a bunch of other podcast-related information, just with the goal of helping you make your podcast better. And if you like the music that we're rudely talking on top of right now, head on over to Best Day's page at SoundCloud. You can find that at soundcloud.com slash best-day. He was on Rolling Misadventures once too. You should check that one out. If you read my show notes, you'd already know which episode it was. But other than that, just grab a game, grab a stack of comics, and go find yourself a new favorite character. Let me know that Alan Arkin was in What's the Bumblebee movie? With the girl that's dressed like a bee. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> Everybody knows what I'm t- talking about now, and I'm just being dumb. See, you bring a Bumblebee movie, and my brain just goes straight to Bee Movie with Jerry Seinfeld. Little Miss Sunshine. Ah, okay. <laughs>